Thank you very much for the introduction, Sven. Um, although Olga isn't here to give the lecture today, I hope I'll be able to take you on a journey through her amazing career to celebrate her prize and show you how she changed the world of crystallography and beyond. Every day I'm inspired by what she achieved and I feel privileged and proud to be part of the centre she founded. I'm Susanna and I run the Cambridge Structural Database at the CCDC, but today is all about Olga, Dr. Olga Kennard, a truly amazing and inspirational scientist and the 12th recipient of the IUCR's EVALD Prize. The prize was announced last year and was awarded for Olga's pioneering contribution to the development of crystallographic databases, in particular the Cambridge Structural Database, or CSD for short. The announcement describes how her vision and efforts in the field were fundamental in the development of crystal engineering. It also outlines her fundamental impact on the development of modern crystallography. When the prize was announced, the IUCR asked Olga about her life and work, and in her published account, she tells us that she was born in Budapest, Hungary, and lives there until just two weeks before the onset of war when she moved to England. There, she enrolled at Hove County Grammar School, passing all her exams apart from English. She then moved to a school in Iversham, choosing to study science, which she says was the one constant between her life in Hungary and England. She describes how important education and learning were in her family, with no distinction between boys and girls, and her next step was enrolling at one of the two women's colleges in Cambridge. There, in addition to three other subjects, she opted for mineralogy, which at the time, she says, had very little mention of X-ray crystallography. From Cambridge, she came, became Max Perutz's assistant, but was not permitted to try for a higher degree, and in her words, only became a respectable scientist much later. She describes how this was the only time in her career where she met discrimination as a woman and how extremely supportive the crystallographic community were. Her path then led her to work with J.D. Bernal and go on to establish the CCDC, and of course, more recently, win the Evald Prize. So let us delve a bit deeper into the path that led her to be awarded this prize. Working with Max Perutz, Olga co-authored a paper on the crystal structure of a gold complex and one year later in 1947, co-authored an early publication on haemoglobin in nature. The following year, her journey her journey took her from the laboratories in London back to Cambridge, and she published two papers that perhaps give us our first inclination about her passion for data accuracy. The first outlines procedures for determining accurate cell dimensions from single crystal X-ray photographs, and the second outlines a rapid and reliable technique for setting single crystals from zero layer line photographs. Olga describes her involvement in the data field starting when J.D. Bernal became the first chairman of the IUCR Commission on Crystallographic Data and asked her to be secretary. You can see her involvement in the commission up until 1969, becoming the chair herself between 66 and 69. This involvement in data and her association with both J.D. Bernal and Max Perutz led Olga to found the CSD, help set up the Protein Data Bank, and be a guiding influence for the establishment of the Nucleic Acid Sequence Database by persuading the European Molecular Biology Organization to embark on it. Nowadays, to complete this circle, the small molecules contained in biological structures archived in the PDB are validated using CCDC software, which incorporates the knowledge embodied in the CSD. With this circle leading us back to the CSD and Olga's pioneering contribution to our field, we're going to focus on this valuable resource. Today, the CSD contains over 1.1 million structures and includes data published in associated scientific articles, patents, repositories, thesis publications, or published directly through the database. It's a truly global effort and the entire community should be proud of their contribution. Data sets are determined by researchers worldwide and every single CSD entry is enriched and annotated by experts at CCDC to aid the discoverability of data and knowledge from the resource. The million structure depicted here um, was added in 2019 and shortly after that the database became a certified core trust seal repository. 
The journey to the One Million structure started, of course, with Olga, and you can see the timeline for how the CSD has evolved in the 56 years since. This timeline is in the foyer of the CCDC building in Cambridge, and standing in front of it is our current CEO, Jürgen Harter, holding the certificate for Olga's Ewald Prize. We're now going to look back over this timeline by decade and see just how visionary Olga's scientific career was. Before we look at the CSD, let's put it into the context of what else was going on in the decade. If we think about what technical advances were happening in this decade, we can see that the cassette tape was first released. But perhaps more importantly, early computers were in operation with the invention of the microchip accelerating use. One of the early uses of computers was by NASA on the Apollo moon landings. And the decade also saw the introduction of touch tone telephones and inter-city rail. So it really was a period of tremendous change. Back in Cambridge, Olga Kennard and J.D. Bernal had a vision that the collective use of data would lead to new knowledge and generate new insights. This vision led Olga to establish the beginnings of the CSD in the chemistry department at the University of Cambridge. And this photo shows, among others, J.D. Bernal and Olga Kennard at Stonehenge some years earlier. And although the CSD doesn't quite go back to when Stonehenge was built, it really was remarkable for its time. So what was um, the vision? Olga gave a lecture about the shared vision in 1995, and she described data banks like the CSD having three main functions. The first, to gather the knowledge and make it available to the community. The second, to transform the data into a knowledge base. And the last, to facilitate the comparison and collective analysis of individual experiments to gain new insights. I think the thousands of research papers published using the CSD and associated search and analysis tools demonstrate this is certainly ca the case today. And I hope to show you during this talk what an amazing foresight they had. I've heard stories that the early CSD creation involved punch cards, knitting needles, and a team either working from home or a small office in the chemistry department. Um, thankfully, when they first started, there were only a few thousand structures because Olga describes it as quite a laborious process. Right from the outset, Olga understood the importance of data quality, and perhaps this comes back to some of her early publications. An event to celebrate 50 years of the CSD in 2015, Olga told us that she wanted the CSD to contain numbers that could be relied on. So an elaborate set of checks were introduced so the database could be used with confidence. Her vision and foresight are certainly appreciated at the CCDC today. And without that start, a lot of the ways we can use structural data just might not be possible. It took five years um, to collate the first set of structures, and these were first distributed in book form through the publication of the Molecular Structures and Dimensions book series. The volumes were electronically typeset, a huge achievement at the time, and consisted of bibliographic information as well as introducing rudimentary ways of searching. And you can see an example here of a structure published by Olga and James Walker in 1963. And in the book, you can see an index of chemicals and authors, and there's also an index of formulas. So we can see that not only did Olga establish the CSD, she also contributed data sets. She has authored over 150 small molecule structures, and we saw the first of these structures published in 1946 earlier in the talk. One of her most recent structures was um, from 1991, shown on the right hand side. By 1965, over 4,500 structures had been published and it took five years to create the first book. The book contained the first organic structure with 3D coordinates published in 1936 by Linus Pauling, as well as the first metal organic structure with 3D coordinates published just one year later um, in 1938 by Monteith Robinson. 66% of the structures published up until 1970 were organic. The majority don't have coordinates in the CSD and there were mainly single component structures. So let's now move on to the 1970s. In the wider world, the first email was sent and the programming language C first appeared. In 1975, the first digital camera was engineered 
and in fact, it weighed a hefty 80 pounds. In 1977, NASA launched two robotic probes. And later in the decade, in 1979, the first Sony Walkman was launched. In the world of crystallography, 1969 saw the establishment of the first European crystallographic community. At the first ECM meeting in Bordeaux uh, in 1973, Olga was listed as the UK ECC representative. And then in 1975, she was made president of the committee. The main objective of the committee was to coordinate in a concerted fashion European meetings. Each country retaining, to use the words of Olga, its national identity and organising the meeting in its own style and tradition so that the ECMs benefited from the rich cultural variety of Europe. And this has certainly been achieved in successive ECMs. At the ECM in Oviedo in 2018, I spoke in a session celebrating women in crystallography. And for that session, I asked Olga if she would allow me to include a video of her in a talk. And I wanted to share a part of her response, which highlights her strong independence. I think that the symposium and that uh, the president, the, the then president, Alicia Baki, promoting gender equality in her opening speech in Oviedo shows that the ECA really does a lot to strive for gender balance. And I'm sure Olga helped to lead the way in that. In the world of the CCDC, scientists have been starting to use the volumes of molecular structures and dimensions, and they're an immediate hit. This is a book review written in 1977. The reviewer notes that the book should please scientists and points out some alternative uses, including using it to prop open doors, press flowers, or ensure others don't see you taking a nap. As well as being amusing, it points to the issue that whilst people might value a physical book, the intrinsic value to the data within is sometimes harder to appreciate. The review also highlighted a couple of other potential issues that a chemist might face, even with the relatively small number of structures that there were categorization issues even then. The CCDC has worked tirelessly over the years to try and overcome these as the amount of data continues to grow. As suggested in the review, finding the entries of interest became a critical problem. George Jeffrey, the reviewer, concludes by saying it is an essential resource and thank heavens for Olga and her colleagues who had the good sense to start getting these structural data organised before it swamped us. These sentiments could act as a challenge now. What should we be doing now that in years to come will prove so timely? So how were people using the data in the 1970s? Two people that put it to very good use were Berge and Dunnitz, who used the crystallographic data in combination with theoretical studies to derive the berge dunnitz angle. A quick search in the CSD um, shows that there would now be over 20,000 CSD entries to choose from if you wanted to redo this work. And what was found then, using just six entries, is essentially still true today. So how was the CSD changing during the 1970s? Well, the number of published structures tripled in size. Most structures now had coordinates and the structures were starting to contain a wider diversity of elements. The number of structures containing lanthanides and actinides was certainly on the increase. In the world of protein crystallography, Olga is one of the co-authors of a publication describing the establishment of the Protein Data Bank, a computer-based archival file for macromolecular structures. And amazingly, at this Congress, uh, we can see many talks about the impact and value of the PDB in its 50th year. As well as contributing structures to the CSD, Olga went on to contribute data sets to the PDB2, uh, and she describes it as a wonderful time solving increasingly complex structures as instrumentation and computing became more and more powerful. At the end of her time in the lab, the team were able to solve the structure of a fragment of DNA with a base pair mismatch to one angstrom resolution. As we see the complexity and wealth of structural data increasing at the CCDC, it was recognised that it would be a huge challenge for researchers to analyse and utilise such a large volume of information. And so the aim by 1980 was to have a fully retrospective database. And by the end of the decade, a database had been created and the nucleus of searching software had been developed. 
The resultant ref codes could be extracted and the system allowed the user to analyze the coordinate data for those entries using command line programs. So back to the timeline and now let's move to the 1980s. In 1981, the IBM PC was launched and this completely changed the way people worked. A few years later, Apple Mac went on sale and a year after that, the Windows operating system was released. The 1980s also saw the development of the compact disc and the first consumer cell phone hit the market. Despite its huge size, huge price and poor battery life, it was in high demand and apparently there was a waiting list of people wanting to buy it. If we look at the CSD, um, the number of published structures roughly tripled in size and we can see that the percentage of structures with coordinates is thankfully going up. We can also see for the first time most of the new structures are actually metal organic and the first structure with bonding to a group 18 element was determined. If we look at the CST today we can see that the proportion of metal organic structures is still higher with a percentage of around 57% in the database as a whole and these structures started to dominate from the early 1990s. In the 1980s, the team at CCDC were busy manually transcribing hand-typed tables of uh, coordinates into the database records. And by volume 13 in the Molecular Structures and Dimensions series, computer-produced diagrams of the chemical structure were added to really illustrate each compound. And this greatly extended the utility and usability of the series and was rather ahead of its time. Here you can see a diagram generated from one of Olga's structures published in 1980. In the 1980s, we can also see how Olga and Robin Taylor are surveying the CSD and how fundamental this research is in the development of the field of crystal engineering. In this article published in 1982, Olga and Robin surveyed 130 neutron structures and conclude that CHO, CHN and CHCL interactions are more likely to be attractive than repulsive, which suggests that they can be reasonably described as hydrogen bonds. Today, uh, the CCDC software Mercury enables reacher yeah. enables researchers to explore the nature of hydrogen bonded networks. Um, the strength of hydrogen bonds and derived grass set description. So we can see how this early work has influenced what is relied on by scientists worldwide. So how else was the CSD being used in the 1980s? It was clearly a valuable lookup tool, but it was also being used to tabulate data. Molecular geometry is vitally important in understanding chemical structure and bonding. Over the years, compilations of some of this information had appeared with the first major compilation published in 1959. In the 1980s, Olga, Frank Allen and team set about to do a comprehensive study of bond types after recognizing the amount of data now held in the CSD is so large that there was a need for concise printed tabulations of average molecular dimensions. And this work has gone on to be cited over 11,000 times. In the 1980s, we also saw a new way to increase the amount of data in the CSD, and it became possible for crystallographers to publish data directly through the CSD without an associated scientific article in what we now call a CSD communication. Back then, there were only a handful of structures published in this way, but we can see today these types of structures now account for around 10% of the new structures published in the CSD. This decade also saw Olga receive well-deserved recognition for her efforts. In 1987, she was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society, and two years later, she was awarded the OBE for Services to Scientific Research on the Structure of Biological Molecules. And I think there's now a fellowship set up in her name by the Royal Society where special provisions are included for women. Let's now move to the 1990s. This was once again a period of tremendous change with the launch of the World Wide Web, which also saw companies such as Amazon and eBay start up. In the world of computing, perhaps the best 
well-known open source software Linux was released. And the way we communicate and listen to music was again changing. 2G phones were launched, leading to the advent of SMS messaging and MP3 players were developed. The team back at the CCDC were undoubtedly starting to use some of these new technologies. And you can see they were also following the fashion of the decade too. And the eagle-eyed among you might just be able to spot Olga in the photo. It wasn't just the fashion that changed though, the home of CCDC was changing as well. The 1990s saw the construction of the CCDC building in Cambridge, overseen by Olga and designed by the Danish architect, Professor Eric Christian Sorensen. In fact, it won the Sunday Times Building of the Year Award in 1993. And we can see Olga with the Duke of Edinburgh when the building was opened. Staff at the new headquarters also processed a record number of structures, with the 100,000 structure published at the start of the decade, the database doubled inside, in size over the preceding 10 years. The 200,000 structure was announced at the 19, uh, meeting in 1999, and the announcement included the news that Robin Rogers, the author of the structure, would win a suitable commemorative item. Apparently, upon hearing this, Robin asked for a Rolls Royce, and so, of course, CCDC obliged, and the car is now located in Robin's office, I believe. We also started to see new classes of molecules emerge, and one of these was fullerenes. Fullerene was first discovered in 1985, and then the race was on to determine the first fullerene structure. The first structures were published just six years later, and remarkably, 11 structures were published in 10 articles in the same year. This decade also saw the number of metal organic frameworks in the CSD rise above 100, and you can see in the next few years, the number continued to increase. Today, MOFs account for a significant part of the CSD with over 100,000 structures. And so we've had to evolve not only how we process these types of structures, but also some of our visualization and search tools. Here you can see a MOF structure with polyhedra display, which is now available through Mercury. MOFs today are used in a wide variety of applications from gas storage to batteries. And we've also started to see them used to help determine new structures by the creation of molecular sponges. With an increase in these complicated structure, the C structures, the CCDC has subsequently established a collaboration with David Farron Jimenez at the University of Cambridge to develop a MOF subset. As you can see, um, this was a complicated uh, setup, but it greatly aids scientists working in the area. More recently, we have launched our free CSD moth collection of over 10,000 porous moths to aid high throughput analysis. Over the next decades, the way crystallographic data was published uh, started to change. In this Jack's article from 1998, the crystallographic data moved from the main article to the supplementary information in PDF format. And that was common for a lot of the more general journals. We can also see the crystallographer not being listed as an author. Um, today, things have evolved since then. Um, there are usually electronic links from the article to data stored at the CCDC and during deposition, depositors are able to add details of the crystallographer and that information is made available when users view and retrieve the structure to help maintain the provenance and attribution of the data set. In the 1990s, something else was changing in the world of crystallography which would completely change the way in which small molecule crystal structure data was communicated. The 1990s saw the introduction of the CIF, a standard file format, and it's been widely adopted by both the crystallographic and publishing communities. At the CCDC, 1991 also saw the development of new search functionality. Uh, these days, we tend to take chemical sketching software for granted, but back then, drawing packages were still quite new. And going from text-based searching to sketching your molecule was really quite revolutionary. And we can see Olga here with some of the team back at CCDC while this was being developed. With so many more structures, users wanted to be able to analyze the data in the CSD more readily. And 1994 saw the launch of VISTA. 
This program allowed users to analyze and display data and provided them with a way to correlate molecular geometry or intermolecular interactions and start to identify trends. Following this, in 1997, uh, CCDC developed its first knowledge base, ISISTAR. And as you might remember, Olga thought that one of the functions of a database like the CSD should be to provide knowledge bases from the data. So ISISTAR uses the wealth of knowledge in both the CSD and the relevant structures in the PDB to allow you to visualize preferences in intermolecular interactions between two functional groups. So it really was a big step forward. Being able to develop such a knowledge base was clearly only possible due to the increasing size and diversity of the CSD. We can also see how ISISTAR is used today in our full interaction map functionality. So let's now move to the 2000s. This decade saw the introduction of the iPhone as well as the beginnings of Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. So the world really was becoming more connected. Another significant milestone on the web was the launch of Wikipedia and user generated content. Back at the CCDC, uh, the CSD was still increasing steadily. During this decade, the CSD doubled in size and we saw the addition of both the quarter of a millionth and the half a millionth structure. On the right hand side, the half a millionth structure um, is shown and this is a drug molecule called lamotrigine. The CCDC's response to the increasing number of structures and to the desktop revolution was the development of Conquest. This is a new, was a new search interface to the CSD and it allowed users to search the CSD in a much more accessible way and had a number of different search options. With a growing number of structures, it was recognized that alongside new search functionality that structure visualization was key. In 2001, this led to the release of Mercury, which centered on the visualization of organic crystals. Mercury has grown significantly since then, and it's now the hub um, for many components of the CSD portfolio. Three years later, the launch of, after the launch of Mercury, CCD CCDC developed Mogul, a knowledge base of geometrical information, so bond lengths, angles and torsions derived from structures in the CSD. This knowledge base enables you to assess the molecular geometry of your new structure by comparing the geometries of the million plus structures in the CSD. Mogul is also embedded in the PDB deposition pipeline, so depositors can check the geometry of their ligands as well. And in a similar way, Mogul could be used to help validate theoretical data sets. During this decade, the pharmaceutical industry started to look into how they could utilize structural data more. There were a growing number of drug molecules in the database, and as we've seen, the half a million structure was a drug too. There were other reasons why pharmaceutical companies started looking at the data more though. In 1996, Abbott released a new HIV drug called Ritonavir. Unfortunately, after release, ritonavir started changing form and the new form had different physical properties, so it had to be quickly withdrawn from market. This had a huge financial impact for Abbott, but more importantly, it affected the patients that were relying on this drug for treatment. So people started to question um, if this change of forms could have been um, identified earlier. Bob Doherty, from Pfizer, among others, started to use the term solid form informatics, and they started to use structural knowledge to inform key decisions in pharmaceutical development. Solid form informatics now plays a crucial role in the solid form development workflow at most major pharmaceutical companies, and strong partnerships now exist between industry and the CCDC. So could these tools have been used to predict ritonavir was not the most stable form? Using the tools we have available today, I think we can say yes. We can see that the marketed form of ritonavir wasn't the most stable. And the use of structural data and these techniques are now used routinely in drug development to assess solid form stability and the likelihood of occurrence of another case of ritonavir. Today at the CCDC, we've developed a range of tools to allow users to do complex structural analysis, 
perform solid form risk assessment and carry out solid form design. And we can really start to appreciate the foresight that Olga had in establishing this rich source of data. As the structures are added to the CSD, the volume and diversity available to these tools increases too. And so the confidence in the results also increases. With increasing web technology being developed in the 2000s, we also saw the release of CCDC's first web-based tool, WebCSD. WebCSD provided access to the data, including a range of different search options, and its launch also meant that we were able to release data more quickly. And with a growing number of structures added each week, this was really becoming uh, even more paramount. Swift release of data meant we had to evolve our workflows with publishers and we worked to automate processes between the CCDC and the journals to enable us to add data at the point of publication. So how have things changed since 2010? Well, the walls, or at least our devices, definitely have ears, and technologies such as Amazon Echo and Alexa have been released. There's also been lots of effort into automation and the development of things like self-driving cars. This decade has also seen an increase in virtual reality and games such as Pokemon Go, and I'm told the building um, at CCDC in Cambridge is an excellent location for catching them. This decade saw the CSD double in size again and reached the big one million, a huge milestone for structural chemistry. But this wasn't the only celebration of the decade. Midway through in 2015, the CSD turned 50. We celebrated with a CSD 50 symposium at Downing College, Cambridge, and I was privileged to meet Olga for the first time and hear her deliver an outstanding open lecture. If you haven't listened to it, um, I would really encourage you to look it up on YouTube or you can use the QR code on this slide. It was an amazing lecture and even more so because she was in her 90s when she delivered it. During the symposium, we also heard a talk from Greg Ferenc about the establishment of the CSD teaching database, which is now used by educators and students worldwide and further spreads the legacy that Olga created. This teaching database, along with the other 1.1 million structures in the wider CSD, can now be viewed on mobile phones and tablet devices. The database is updated every second, and perhaps one of the most important developments is that every single individual structure is available to view and download for free through our Access Structures service. This has made the data much more accessible worldwide and follows a general trend for data. The general trend for data accessibility saw the concept of FAIR launched in the wider data community in 2014. The FAIR principles were published two years later and they state that data should be findable, interoperable, accessible and reusable. At the CCDC, these guidelines have helped us change the way we manage scientific data and the development of new standards and standard identifiers have seen us use things like INCHI to match structures between the CSD and external databases and assign each structure a persistent identifier in the form of a DOI. In 2010, the CCDC also launched an online deposition process, and now we get well over 90% of our depositions via this route. Today, the online deposition process is multi-step, um, interactive, um, enabling depositors to correct syntax, check the integrity of their data sets, and enhance their depositions. Post deposition, our curation process at the CCDC have changed, but we still hold dear Olga's original thoughts about the importance of data quality and numbers that can be relied on. Each structure undergoes extensive validation and curation processes, and data sets are enhanced with chemical representations and chemical connectivity to really make sure the data is as discoverable and reusable as possible. Fittingly, we also use the data in the CSD to help us assign this chemical connectivity using a tool called Decipher that was developed in-house. So what does the resource that Olga established look like today? Over the years, the CSD has grown in size and complexity and the people contributing structures to the database has also spread worldwide. 
I thought it might be fun to try and calculate how much effort has gone into its creation. And my rough calculation takes us to a massive 1,500 person years in total. So I think we can all share George Jeffrey's sentiments and say thank heavens for Olga and her colleagues who had the good sense to start getting these structural data organised before it swamped us. In the CSD today, we can see a mix of organic and metal organic structures with a split between single and multi-component complexes. The resource is used in a variety of industries and as well as atomic coordinates and crystallographic information, it contains a significant amount of additional data, including melting points, crystal shapes and colours, bioactivity data and oxidation states. If we delve a bit deeper using our CSD Python API, we can see how the chemistry inside the CSD has changed over the years. And on the left, keep your eye out for the rapid rise of MOFs. Um, we can also see that the diverse number of elements present inside the structures in the CSD and their most common colours and shapes reported for small molecule um, structures. So I think we can just see MOFs about third place now. But we can't just look inside the CSD and Olga showed us that from the start with her work to establish the PDB or help establish the PDB. Chemistry and biology were, are becoming more connected and at the CCDC we are increasing connections through links between the CSD and the PDB as well as the development of CSD cross mainer that enables pharmacophore queries against these two databases. More recently, we've joined a grant-funded project with PDBE and Kemble to work together to aggregate data. I mentioned CSD Crossminer, and that is just one part of the CSD portfolio today. Our value-added services allow researchers to search, visualise and analyse structural data, and they support the discovery of new molecules with pharmaceutical applications and help researchers predict the stability and properties of a substance. The CSD portfolio includes a range of desktop software, web tools and programmatic access through our CSD Python API, all underpinned, of course, by the CSD. This diverse portfolio goes back to Olga and J.D. Bernal's original vision that the collective use of data would lead to new knowledge and generate new insights. That vision has certainly come to fruition today, and we can see many examples of this, including in the 33 articles authored by researchers in both industry and academia in the special issue of Christenge.com published last year in celebration of CSD 1 million. From the thousands of research papers published by researchers worldwide, we can see that Olga's vision is very much alive. Our partnerships with companies in the pharmaceutical industry also show us every day that the CSD is used to help develop new drugs and we see firsthand the impact the resource has had, not just to crystallographers, but to the wider world. The CSD contains a wealth of information about drug structures. If we look at the top 200 drugs by retail sale, we can see how many are found in the CSD colour coded in green. It's clear small molecules have led to many new drug approvals in 2020, but as well as that, they are opening up new biological and therapeutical opportunities, are competing against emergent modalities for rare diseases and are being used to target RNA. Several drugs in the CSD have also been investigated as potential targets against COVID-19. We have identified over 100 structures um, that have been investigated so far, and here are just a handful of them. So you really never know how a, a structural data might be used in the future and the impact it might have on our everyday lives. The CSD isn't just used in the pharmaceutical industry though, and this publication uh, published by Robin Taylor and Pete Wood describes the whole really is greater than the parts and how it can be used in a range of different applications from structure solution to gas storage and separation. So how could the CSD evolve in the future? One area that could significantly impact the future growth of the CSD is electron diffraction. It's still early days with just over 130 structures currently in the database determined by this emerging technique. But I think it's definitely an area to watch and I'm looking forward to hearing about the latest research in this field during the Congress. 
We are also seeing a rise in interest and research in calculated structures. And perhaps if we are not careful, this could be the area that swamps us. With 2020 seeing the launch of the seventh CCDC blind test to challenge the community to predict the correct solid form for a handful of molecules, we are working together with the community to help set guidelines for submission so that others can learn more from the outputs of this challenge. Over the last uh, few years, AI and machine learning have also risen in popularity and are buzzwords, but several researchers have shown how we can actually use AI and machine learning techniques on data in the CSD. I think the rise in the use of uh, this type of research has also shown that they are only useful techniques if you can trust your data, if you understand the data, and if you can correctly interpret the results. And all of that comes back to Olga's focus on the importance of data quality and a vision for how the CSD should be created. Today, we are also seeing the use of the CSD spread across the globe, and it's always a privilege to meet scientists worldwide that share a passion for the CSD and tell us how much they rely on it in research and education. Here you can see a few of the worldwide crystallographic schools and conferences we've had the pleasure of being involved in, and I've lost count of the number of people who have spoken to me about the impact Olga had on their careers. At the last IUCR Congress meeting in India, the CCDC also launched the FAIR program to further support research and education in developing nations through access to the CSD. And as well as increasing the access of the CSD globally, we've been busy engaging future scientists with the wonders of crystallography through science festivals, home learning resources, and videos de designed for kids. And we also have a battle game, game card that you can play on Instagram, as you can see on the right. So I think it's clear that Olga is a true visionary. Her efforts have shaped the way crystallography has evolved over the last half a century. We are honored at the CCDC to work for the organization she established. Every day, we see the value that this resource has for researchers and educators worldwide. And we appreciate the privilege to continue to create the Cambridge Structural Database. Olga has impacted both our field and the people within the field. And we have captured some of the way she has influenced colleagues in the community on our website. We would love to hear your stories too, so Olga can see how she's changed our world of crystallography and beyond. I wanted to conclude the celebration with some photos of Olga herself, including one at where she is pictured next to Evold at, I think you can just see them there. And if I zoom in, she, her and Evold are pictured. Um, you can also see the um, congratulation note sent by the IUCR. After receiving the prize and the card last week, she said she was most touched by the content, the medal, the citation, and above all, the messages from so many old friends and colleagues. So before we give Olga the biggest in-person and virtual applause for her amazing contribution to science, let's finish with one final inspiration quote from Olga herself in her lecture in 1995, where she said, I think that the great ocean of truth is still in front of us and that we continue to discover new aspects of this truth. So with that, a huge thank you, Olga, from everyone at the CCDC, at the Congress and in the community. And the hugest congratulations from all of us on winning the 12th Evold Prize. <laughs>